Now this story may sound over the top, but believe me, sometimes stories like these are not as unusual as you think. There have been many outlandish surgical modifications that people have done to themselves, but this one may outweigh everything you've seen on the internet. More details will be disclosed at the end of the story. Everyone knows that bosses can be a major pain in someone's life. The archetype of a crass, penny-pinching employer is so universal that it became a major character in Spongebob, a cartoon that defined a generation and continues to be relevant and inspiring to this day, despite being over 20 years old at this point. And while I'm sure many people out there do from time to time derisively refer to their boss as a real-life Mr. Krabs, I very seriously doubt that anyone has truly experienced a boss so unwittingly faithful to the character that they could actually earn the title. That is except for me and my co-workers. I've worked at a Red Lobster ever since I got out of college, and the man who used to run the restaurant was as close to being the real-life Mr. Krabs as any human being could possibly get, both in personality and physiology. He always had a pear-shaped body and big old meat hooks for hands. But the real similarities had started with his business practices. He was a man of strict morals, to say the least. Not wholesome or virtuous morals, however. They were purely financially driven but he stuck to them like rubber and glue. He was the biggest cheapskate I've ever met in my life. All the staff worked for minimum wage, and he never gave a single one of us a raise, except for what marginal increases were literally required by law every year. He also made sure that nobody ever worked more than 40 hours a week, because the concept of overtime pay probably would have given him an aneurysm if he actually had to shell it out. Thankfully, it went both ways. If he ever caught a customer about to leave a tip of less than $5, he'd sit there and chew them out, blocking their exit until they were so embarrassed that they'd end up leaving 30%. Excuse me, lad, but are you royalty? Do you think me hardworking employees have served you and catered to your every need for over an hour out of the kindness of their hearts? Because you're special? No! They're working, and you're paying! Service is not free, and it's worth more than three measly dollars! It was honestly quite the spectacle. For all I can say about his economic prudence, though, he wasn't bad at running the business at all. Actually, after working there for about a year or so, I finally had an idea of how to put my business degree to good use, since I had been collecting dust for some time. I decided to reach out to old Mr. Krabs and ask to be trained as a manager, in the hopes of one day owning my own restaurant, or maybe even taking up ownership of the Red Lobster someday. He laughed off the idea of me replacing him, but he was receptive to me training for management. But unfortunately, it was around that time that he took me on as a pseudo-apprentice that I started to learn some of his... stranger habits. We'd always jokingly called him Mr. Krabs because of his money-loving attitude, but we were surprised when he seemed to revel in the nickname. We thought it might be because of the fact that Red Lobster is an establishment that specializes in selling crabs and other shellfish, and he might be interpreting the nickname as a recognition of his ability as a boss. But I came to learn that was not it at all. So, me lad! You want me to teach you the ins and outs of the restaurant business. Good workers are hard to come by, but you've proven yourself. I'll tell you my secret. Come with me. Uh, all right, sir. He took me to the lobster tank at the front of the restaurant. It was early in the morning, before opening, so the tank was packed full of lobsters. He stooped down and pressed his face up against the glass. You see these babies? These puppies are my money makers, but they're more than just that. I've always loved the ocean's creepy crawlies, you see. Crabs, lobsters, shrimps, they just understand me. People always want all that huggy, kissy crap. These little guys just pinch. That's all they do is pinch. Isn't that right, you little cretins? You don't care about nothing, do you? Wouldn't you just love to clip the nose right off me face? You see, Rick, the lobsters need to be taken care of, or they won't taste good. The crabs come in frozen, so they're low maintenance. But the lobsters are special. My whole world got turned upside down in that moment. I always thought that he had a wife or something that he could go home to and drop the crabbiness. But it was then that I realized that lobsters and crabs were like this man's spirit animals. And the only thing he loved more than keeping them around and babying them like pets was when he got to have them killed and cooked and dismembered to make him money. I didn't learn anything useful about how to run a business from any of that, but it was informative in a different way. This guy is straight up nuts. I thought to myself as I awkwardly smiled at him and backed away slowly to the kitchen to start my shift. In secret, I spread the word around about how infatuated the boss was with the company Shellfish. And unsurprisingly, this only cemented his identity as the real-life Mr. Krabs. However, as harmless as this seemed initially, it became a problem one day. 
The lobster tank is where we keep all the lobsters that we cook and serve to customers, so there's always members of the kitchen staff reaching in and grabbing them. For this reason, there's no lid on the tank. That, in turn, is one of the reasons why there's always a staff member somewhere around the tank, to make sure nothing stupid happens to it. That employee is usually the host or hostess since they're at the front most of the time anyway. There was one particular occasion in which we just hired a new hostess who wasn't very assertive. I think it was her first job or something, because she was always very nervous and soft-spoken. So, when some boneheaded teenager thought it would be funny to stick his hands in the lobster tank while the hostess wimpy plaintiff cries did little, if anything at all, the next person to catch the kid in the act was the boss man himself. Oh my gosh! Don't do that! Please! Stop it! Get your grubby mitts out of me lobster tank, you lanky boo-licking ravisher! I heard his screams from across the restaurant and rushed to the scene. The boss was holding a meat tenderizer for some reason, and I saw in his eyes that he was about to lunge. I acted quickly, holding him back as he swung the hammer around trying to hit the kid in the face. The kid realized he'd gotten in over his head, so he and all his friends rushed out of there, blushing and snickering. I did my best to calm him down, but he was mad, like some kind of overprotective father. It took a while to get the murder out of his eyes. We managed to keep the incident from being reported to corporate, but we all knew that something had to be done. I had the idea of taking over running the restaurant for a few weeks while he went on vacation. Perhaps I've been taking all this lobster business too seriously. I guess it would be good to take some time off for myself. All right, I'm leaving the restaurant to you, Rick. I trust you now, so don't do me wrong. This place better be in ship shape when I get back. Sure thing, Mr. Krabs. I mean, sir. <laughs> when he left, every single employee breathed a deep sigh of relief. No longer would there be a gruff, intolerable man breathing down our necks, micromanaging us and criticizing us. With me on top, that place became peaceful and serene, while still running like a well-oiled machine. Granted, I hadn't hired any of those workers, but lo and behold, I didn't have to become Mr. Krabs to be a good boss to them. Things went on like that for about a month before we got word from the man. He texted me early one morning and said he would be returning after close that night. I worked everyone a little bit harder to make sure everything was clean and organized for his return. I was actually kind of nervous. I'd enjoyed being the man on top and didn't really feel ready to relinquish the position just yet. So after everything closed up, I waited in his office and tried to think up a pitch I could give him that could keep me as the weekend manager or something like that. But when he <gasps> left, all that went out the window. He walked through the door looking downright grotesque. His hands had been surgically disfigured to look like the pincers of a lobster. There were a natural protrusion sticking out of his head that were meant to look like antennae. And he'd even tattooed his eyes black to look like the beady eyeballs of a lobster. Long time no see, me lad. What the hell happened to you? Oh, this. It's called the Krukenberg procedure. Google it. I had a black market doctor do it. Pretty neat, right? I wanted to take my girlfriend to the seafood restaurant I looked up on Google for our anniversary. Pictures of large crustaceans flooded the entire website. But what really caught my eye was the picture of a couple. The man was down on his knees presenting a velvet ring box in front of the woman who shed tears of joy. It was the perfect marriage proposal. And this time it would be my turn. I made a reservation on a Wednesday evening after confirming that my girlfriend was free because I thought booking on a Wednesday would help us avoid the huge crowd. So I picked up my girlfriend from work and we went to a restaurant called Red Lobster. When we arrived there, everything was going smoothly. We were ushered by one of the servers who cordially led us to our seats. The plan was that I would order the most enormous lobsters on the menu, and as soon as we had our meal, I would kneel down and propose to her. As we skimmed through the menu, my girlfriend complimented me for choosing the perfect place, so naturally I was filled with joy, confident she would love my big surprise right at the end. Moments later, a waitress approached our table. She had a corpulent physique. Her body smelled of rotten fish. Her hair was left in disarray and her uniform was seemingly too tight for her body, built with buttons almost giving way. She looked at my girlfriend and me with disgust. Instinctively, I wanted to ask her what her problem was but didn't really want to ruin the mood, so I let it go. Then, pouting her lips, she said, 
Let me guess. You're here for this month's special? I didn't like her tone, but I proceeded to respond kindly, saying, Oh, yes, please. Two giant lobsters for me and my special lady. And could you kindly add some shrimp balls, onion rings, and grilled squid, too? Thank you. She snickered as she jotted down our order. My girlfriend must have noticed my growing infuriation because she gently held my hand and extended an affable smile to calm me down. Then, the waitress spoke again and said, Would that be all? I nodded, trying to suppress my anger. Then, just when I thought she would turn away and head back to the kitchen, with her arms akimbo, she added, It's gonna take 35 minutes for the squid, shrimp, onion rings, and the lobsters, so I hope Miss Piggy over here can wait. Then she placed her dirty fingers atop my girl's shoulder, looking down at her, and said, And don't munch on the linen cloth until I get back, you understand? Was this some kind of elaborate prank? Because if it was, it wasn't a pretty good one. I was at my limit, and despite my girlfriend glancing at me, signaling a placid retreat, I stood up anyway and said, Who do you think you are, huh? How dare you badmouth my girlfriend like that? She snickered once more, (laughs) undeniably pleased, then said, Really? This flat blob over here is your girlfriend? How could you stoop so low? I clenched my fists intending to punch her, ceased by the moment my girlfriend held both my hands shedding tears, asking me to let it slide. I took a deep breath and firmly demanded to give our order to another waitress to save us further trouble. But instead, she simply rolled her eyes and said, Sure, whatever. This night was supposed to be a romantic and convivial evening, but there was no way I would allow anyone to disrespect my girlfriend like that. Despite that, for the next 15 minutes, I was able to forget about that rude waitress and engage in a sweet conversation with my girlfriend. Then, moments later, I noticed the same impertinent waitress approach our table, laying down the shrimp balls, grilled squid, and onion rings. In a split second, all that fury came back to me, and so I said, I thought I specifically told you to hand over the job to another waitress. Which part of my request did you not understand? Hey! Shut your pie hole! We're currently understaffed. You've got the food you wanted, didn't you? Now sit down like Miss Piggy over here. She replied without a tinge of remorse. This evening was a mess. There was no way I could propose to her in this situation. I've had enough already! I want to talk to your manager now! My voice was much louder than before, and I didn't care if we caught anyone else's attention at this point. The server from earlier approached me and asked, I'm sorry, sir. What seems to be the problem here? The problem, you say? The problem is that my girlfriend and I just want to enjoy our dinner, but this waitress keeps coming back with a bag of insults! I flared up. The feeling was like a sudden eruption that turned into spontaneous combustion. The waitress bowed her head in embarrassment and remained silent, while the other server reassured me that the enormous lobsters we ordered would arrive soon and that he would offer me free coupons for all the trouble that took place. Then, the server whispered to the waitress and dragged her back to the kitchen to probably give her a good scolding. Five minutes later, the waitress came back. And averting her gaze, she said in a low tone, I'm sorry. Here. Two specials. Upon my request, the server allowed us to take pictures of the lobsters alive with their claws taped up. My girlfriend and I did a couple of selfie shots with the lobsters before the waitress took them back to the kitchen to have them cooked. We waited in anticipation. Then, when the waitress served the cooked lobsters, they both came in giant plates covered by gargantuan cloches. I was a tad suspicious because of the sounds emanating from the silver tableware in front of me, but decided to shrug it off. The waitress removed the cloche and said, Enjoy your lobster. Oh my god! Then it came at me faster than I could dodge it. In an instant, the lobster jolted and clipped my nose with its claws. My girlfriend shrieked in fear as I struggled to break free. Ah! After engaging in battle with a crustacean that seemed like forever, I managed to get it off with the help of a server who yanked it away from me. I screamed in pain as blood gushed out incessantly, and I had to be taken to the hospital for proper treatment. My life was out of danger, but I lost my nose in the process. While lying down in the hospital bed with my girlfriend by my side, we watched the news together and saw the waitress from Red Lobster get arrested. When the other staff members were interviewed, they revealed that she was a victim of domestic violence who took it out on innocent customers. Even if I could still smell the scent of lobsters, I don't think I could ever step into a seafood restaurant ever again. This story was inspired by a 42-year-old woman who entered a Red Lobster restaurant on a Saturday night. She was allegedly belligerent, but it was what she did at the Red Lobster that shocked the staff and fellow customers. 
As a disclaimer, the animation does exaggerate the incident, but overall you'll get the gist of what went down that night. Here's what it looked like. When you train to become a waiter at a semi-fancy restaurant like Red Lobster, you actually have to train as a host for several months before they let you become a server. I didn't know this until I'd already been hired on as a server, and then got stuck in a totally different job. Basically, what this means is your bosses have an excuse to withhold your share of the tips while you get paid less than minimum wage to stand in front of the entrance and greet every single customer that comes through the door. Sounds like an easy job, as long as you're not socially inept. And it is easy most days. When it's not busy, much of the time in a day is spent chilling in silence with the lobsters in the tank by the front door. I always found it weird how they keep them on display. If you didn't know, those lobsters really are the same lobsters that you would eat at Red Lobster if you were to order a lobster. Every once in a while, someone from the kitchen would come by and pluck one out, then abduct it back to the kitchen to be boiled alive and served on a platter. It sounds silly, but when I was working as a host at Red Lobster, it was hard not to get attached to the little guys. Most of the people that come through the door treat the host like a robot, and the servers all basically acted like I didn't exist unless they needed something from me. The lobsters in the tank, though, we had an understanding. I was mindlessly waiting for the clock to hit quitting time so I could be freed from my prison of employment and they were waiting for their claws clamped shut to be put out of their bland, overcrowded misery. Obviously, the lobsters and I were in very different situations, and I guess I sounded crazy talking this much about shellfish, but all this imaginary friendship with the lobsters was born out of a psychological necessity. The monotony of being a host at a restaurant can be soul-crushing, especially when combined with the fact that you're forced to be nice and chatty with people who obviously don't care about you at all. It can get disheartening at times, being around so many people for so many hours, yet feeling like you haven't been acknowledged as a living thing a single time the whole day. But every once in a while, something so amazing happens that it makes every previous mundane hour totally worth it. I think about this day a lot. It was a pretty average Saturday in November, getting later into the evening. Late enough for a good portion of the customers coming through to have already become intoxicated by the drinks they had at whatever work party, backyard barbecue, or tailgate they had just left. Red Lobster is a popular spot for the drunk and middle-aged. It's like getting drunk food at Taco Bell for college students, but for older folks. It was getting to be very busy and I had to watch the tank that was full of lobsters at the start of the afternoon slowly get whittled down until only a handful were left. That's when she walked in. Walked in isn't even the right term. She stumbled in so unhinged and flat-footed that the whole restaurant turned to look at the commotion she made just by coming through the door. She pushed several people out of the way and clambered up to the hosting stand, almost knocking it over with her momentum, reeking of strong spirits in a midlife crisis. I need a table. There's going to be about a 30 to 45 minute wait before any tables are available. Will that be alright? No, that won't be alright. I said I need a table. What's wrong with you? I'm sorry, ma'am, but there are several parties waiting ahead of you. You will get a table if you wait. I gestured to the crowd of people waiting just inside the front door. The crowd of people she'd just barreled through a few seconds ago. She turned back to look at what I was pointing to, then acted like she hadn't even noticed them until this moment. Well, well screw those people. I'm the biggest fan of lobster in this in this whole freaking city. At this point, the woman had started to use obscenities quite liberally, and more than loud enough to be heard over the background noise of the restaurant. The customers around us began looking on with disdain, and that's when the situation caught my manager's attention. Ma'am, if you can't calm down and wait like everyone else, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. Why don't you suck on my spit, Mr. I'm holier than thou? All I wanted was a damn lobster, but you and all your point Dexter little busboys keep getting in my way. All right, that's enough. 
I'm calling the police to have you removed, you disrespectful wench. There was a gasp of silence, a moment of utter shock. I knew the situation had escalated rather quickly, but to hear my manager say something like that to a customer, even under his breath, I just never expected it from him. Maybe he'd been having a bad day, or maybe he and this woman had a history I didn't know about, but it didn't matter. Everyone in the restaurant heard it, and he would never live it down. And unfortunately, though she was so lost in the sauce that she could barely walk, the woman was able to pick up on this breach, and it empowered her even further. Disrespectful? You think I'm disrespectful? Oh, no, no, no. What's disrespectful is making a woman go hungry. Denying her the right to eat when the food is right there. It's right there. You know what? I don't even need all this. I don't need a table or someone to kiss my ass. All I need is one of you. Ma'am, please don't. But it was too late. There was no stopping her as she vaulted over the edge of the tank and crashed down into the water, splashing everyone within a 10-foot radius. The lobsters scurried away from her, but they couldn't get far. Everyone in the restaurant could do nothing but look on in stunned bewilderment at the woman in the lobster tank. Maybe getting flushed with cold, salty water sobered her up a bit, because she was only there for a moment. She grabbed around until she caught hold of a lobster, then she threw it out of the tank. Next, she rather hilariously attempted to climb out a few times, slipping back in on a number of attempts before finally managing to get her old flabby body over the edge of the tank. Then she fell down to the floor like a sack of bricks. She scurried up to her feet, soaking wet and dripping water everywhere looking around with crazed eyes and breathless gritted teeth. While she'd been struggling to climb out, I'd found myself walking over to the lobster that had fallen to the floor, about to pick it up. No! He's mine! The woman screamed in my face and snatched up the lobster before I could lay my hands on it. With the lobster in hand, she looked around one more time at the very unusual scene she had created, then bolted out the door. A few days later, I heard that the police had tracked her down and arrested her, slapping her with some kind of indecent public intoxication charge. My manager seemed to be happy about it, but none of us really liked him after the way he handled the situation to begin with. What struck me, though, was that the woman was never charged with theft, even though that lobster was worth a chunk of change. I never even heard if the lobster was ever recovered. If she ever got home with it, the likelihood is that she tried to cook it and eat it, probably horribly mangling it in the ugly process of her drunken preparation. But I like to think that she had a change of heart on the way home, and instead relieved him of his rubber band restraints and set him free into a channel somewhere. I just want to believe that at least one of those lobsters that came through the restaurant got afforded another chance at life, even if the circumstances were unusual. A 42-year-old woman was arrested Saturday after stealing a live lobster. The Pinellas County Sheriff's Office says the manager of the St. Petersburg Red Lobster asked Kimberly Gable to leave because she was bothering other customers. He told deputies that Gable shouted obscenities as she headed for the door, grabbed a live lobster from the tank near the entrance, and took off. Deputies found Gable nearby, but she no longer had the lobster. She is charged with disorderly intoxication and theft. They just understand me. People always want all that huggy, kissy crap. These little guys just pinch. That's all they do is pinch. Isn't that right, you little cretins? You don't care about nothing, do you? Wouldn't you just love to clip the nose right off me face? 